bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, praise team. You may be seated. Thank you guys for coming today. How many of you know that God is powerful? How many of you know that God is mighty to deliver? It's, it's interesting because the, the Lord has been moving in interesting ways. And you know, it's all about us being obedient to God. Amen. We, we've said it before and we'll say it again. It's never about a man. It's never about a church. It's never about a denomination. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's got to be all about him. We live in a day and age where men and, and, and churches and different things, even, even uh, leaders, you have, you have people out there that are false prophets. The Bible says in the last days that people will heap up teachers to, to give them what their itchy ears want to hear, and they'll be false prophets. And we know we live in a day where there's many that lift themselves up to almost be godlike. And you know what? That's wrong because which one of us is good? Which one of us is good? Which one of us is perfect? Nobody. It's only by the grace of Jesus Christ and that cross that any of us can come in here today and say, Jesus, I love you. Only by his grace. Why? Because we all fall short of the glory of God. Amen. We all fall short. And as we were praying and, and we've been praying, how many of you know that, that in this day and age, the church has begun to drift away from the gifts of the spirit, from, from going and and combating with the enemy, spiritual warfare. The Bible is very, very strong on spiritual warfare. And because some of these topics are not popular, churches, bigger churches, um, different pastors have strayed away from this because they don't want to teach about spiritual warfare. Listen, young ones, you got to know about the demonic activity that's going on in your school that could be causing issues in your own mind and life, and you don't even know why it's happening. Demonic oppression is real right? That we are to put on the armor of God and fight against it. There's things that come against us, but we have to stand up against them. And I'm a firm believer in the power of God. I'm a firm believer in not praying church. I'm a firm believer in the power of the Holy Spirit to baptize his children in fire, that we are more than conquerors in Jesus' name against the enemy. And I'll tell you, I was so blessed on Wednesday night that we had a group of sold out radical prayer warriors here on Wednesday night, and we anointed every seat, we anointed every window, every doorway, walked around the church, and we just said, Lord, if anything has been brought in here that doesn't please you, if anything has happened here that doesn't please you, God, we ask you that you take this church on a path that is your will, not our will. Amen? Here's the thing. The main thing is, the goal for this church has never been numbers. The goal for this church is an anointing and raising up and discipling soldiers that will go out there and not just play church on Sunday and then be undercover Christians during the week all week in different places. The goal is to raise up a body that will go out there, stand in the front lines and go head to head with Satan, knowing that we have the victory, not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ through his word as we speak his words, not our words, but the words of the Bible. We must stand against the enemy in this day and we must be bold about it because I'll tell you what, the enemy's not playing. This might be, this might, I, I wish I could go in deeper with this with you guys. We've been doing this on Wednesday nights. We've been talking about different things. We've been talking about uh, new age satanic movements, stuff that stems back from Anton LaVey and the satanic Bible. We've been talking about this stuff and that's why we were praying against it on Wednesday night. We're praying against it because many people allow stuff to happen in their home in their life, and they let these things fester. And then you know what? There's spiritual wickedness. There's family, there's, there's family curses. There's things. Believe it or not, Colorado has one of the most active. Whoa, there we go. Thank you, Jesus. Colorado has, yeah, the Lord's like, amplify that one. Colorado has one of the most active witch communities in the whole United States. Did you know that? Colorado has the largest Wiccan community. Oh, but Pastor Dave, they're white witches. There's no such thing as a white witch. Everything, every sorcery, every divination, everything that raises itself up against a holy God is an absolute disgrace to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is one life, one love, one way. There's one God. 
And the Lord is the Lord is just shaking things. God is just fixing things. God is moving people into a state of repentance because too long the church has walked way down. Listen to me. You know what I'm talking about. I'm speaking to some of you out there right now. You're like, why do I keep dealing with anxiety? Why do I keep dealing with depression? Why do I keep lashing out in anger? Why does this thing stay dark over me? Why do I always feel like I'm not filled? Why do I always feel like I can't go, go towards God? That's demonic oppression trying to keep you away. I didn't say possession because a Christian cannot be possessed. If you are in Jesus and you belong to him, you cannot be possessed, but you can be oppressed. And the enemy will put that oppression on you. And you know what's sad? Is that a lot of people in the body of Christ today, they walk around in chains of bondage, never able to pray for anybody, never able to serve in the church, never able to come up to a pulpit to preach a sermon. I'll tell you what, I got some young soldiers of God that I've been like, I need you guys to get up here and give your testimony and preach. It's not about this guy speaking. It's about all of us sharing our testimony and encouraging the body together as a familia, amen? This ain't a show, right? This is the work of God. And we need to stand against the the devices and the wiles of the enemy. And if you feel that on you, if you've been battling with that, I want to let you know that you have victory in Jesus Christ. If we just get in our word, if we pray, the enemy cannot win. The enemy is toothless. The Bible says the enemy, the devil is as a roaring lion. It doesn't say he is a roaring lion because there's just one lion and that's the lion of Judah. And our God is powerful. Our God is mighty. And I will tell you, when the Holy Spirit begins to move, demons begin to tuck their tails and they begin to hit the windows, hit the doors because they can't stand the move of God. They cannot stand the word. The complacency in the church has allowed a lot to come in. But I'll tell you something. I see a remnant begin to wake up. I see a remnant that's starting to shake. I see a remnant that's saying, Lord, we'll give up everything. I'm seeing a remnant of people that are being healed from their past. What do I mean by that? A lot of people still come to church and they're like, Lord, Lord, I don't understand. I blame you for the death of a family member. I blame you for what happened in my life. And like we've said before, it's not God's fault. God gave us free will. We mess up our lives. Jesus is always there to welcome us. But when we submit to him and we finally say enough is enough, is it going to be all roses? Is it going to be perfect? No. If you stand up against the enemy, you better expect a boxing match. But you have two choices. This may sound ugly, but this is exactly how it is. You got two choices. Lay down and go along with what the world tells you to do and live for the enemy and let the enemy absolutely rape your joy, rape your life, rape your family, rape the gifts that God has given you and just say, whatever, this is what I'm going to do. And then the enemy will ultimately have the victory in your life. Or you can stand up in the Lord and know that even when the enemy hits you and knocks you down, God will pop you back up and he'll say, keep walking, soldier. Keep walking, soldier, right? Put on the full armor of God. We are more than conquerors. We are victory. And the great thing is that nobody in here has to say, yeah, but Dave, I haven't read the Bible. Or man, you don't know I'm a terrible person. Or I've done this, or I've done this. How can God really use me? It's not about you or me and what we've done. The Bible says greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It's not us and what we've done. It's what he did on the cross. And he lives inside of us that gives us the power to step out in faith and break uh, demonic bondage and speak against things that are coming against God's church today. I told you before, I will not be muzzled on certain things. Where where, where certain places are staying quiet on certain sins, I refuse to do so because God has told us that we must speak the unadulterated truth because the time is coming. Amen? God is good. And as we move on into this next couple chapters, this one hit me. It won't even, it probably won't even take that long, but this one hit me. Because now we've been talking about the types and shadows of Jesus Christ. We've been talking about how the Old Testament is so powerful. A lot of new movements today, right? There's a lot of new movements. I know many churches that will not touch the Old Testament. We won't preach the Old Testament. We'll allude to it once in a while, but it's not important. But let me tell you, if you don't read the Old Testament, you cannot truly appreciate what Jesus did for us. And the Old Testament has Jesus written all over it, right? People just misunderstand it, right? And you, and, and you can't understand the New Testament if you don't see the Old Testament, how it confirms everything that was said and done. The empirical evidence, the scientific evidence, the archaeological evidence is profound. Young people, if you struggle with your faith and you're like, I don't think God is real, I will spend time with you. If you call me and say, Dave, can you break apart an hour or two to spend time with me? I will spend time with you to break down with you some of the stuff, the scientific findings, the digs, the stuff, right? Not that we need it. 
but to help you grow in your faith. Why? Because then you get to a place where you say, I don't need that stuff no more. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? I mentioned this. You guys are those, are those end days disciples. Jesus said when he reappeared after his death, when he reappeared to the disciples, he said, right, they had seen him. They had seen him do miracles, and some of them still doubted him. There's a lot of people that say, God, if you would just show me an angel, if you would just show me a sign, if you would just do this, I would serve you. That's a lie from the pit of hell because the disciples watched Jesus do great miracles, and Peter still rejected God. But what did he say to his disciples in that room? He said, there's going to be some that are coming that won't have to see, and they'll walk in faith. That's you guys. That's me. We may not have seen him face to face. We may not see it, but as we walk in faith, God says, there you go. That's it. I'm going to give you that fire. So as we're moving on today in this short message, and I cannot believe when the Lord put on my heart to teach through the whole Bible, we spent so long in Genesis, but I can't believe I haven't changed any of the sermons for particular weeks, right? I didn't say, oh, I have to find something for Father's Day. No, it's whatever's next in line, and the Lord has been lining it up too perfect. You can't even script this. It's crazy. So if you have your Bibles, let's open up to the chapter 11 of the book of Exodus. Now, if you remember last week, just a quick, just a quick sum up, if you remember last week, kind of what we were saying is we were talking about Moses and we were talking about how God had called him, right? We talked about all the things that he went through, the burning bush, um, him denying God and him doubting himself. And like God was telling him, yo, you need to go talk to Pharaoh. And Moses was like, I don't want to do it, man. Remember all the things he said, Right. So then last week, what we were speaking about was the plagues that came upon Pharaoh. God said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh to let my people go or else. He went, right? He went, go tell my people, go tell him to let my people go. Go tell him to let my people go. And Pharaoh again and again and again resisted and all kinds of stuff. And I want to reiterate the fact that that is proof right there of a God that has mercy and a God that gives people a chance to repent. God did not have to give Pharaoh any chances at all. God could have told Moses, walk in that room, and the minute you walk in that room, I'm going to slay everybody that's against me, and you guys just leave. God could have done that. But in his grace and kindness, he gave Pharaoh so many chances, it was ridiculous. And every time, Pharaoh rejected it. No, I'm not. I don't care what you do. I'm not going to do it, even to the point to where he threatened Moses' life at the end, if you remember last week. So there was this time. Moses kept going back. If you can imagine the discomfort of Moses, he keeps walking into this palace with guards everywhere. And he's like, God said, the great I am said, let my people go. No. Okay. Now we're going to see the attitude begin to shift. There has been several plagues already, horrible things, animals dying, the river turning to blood, ruining their ecosystem, doing different things, all kinds of stuff. Nine plagues total have happened already. And Pharaoh still says no. By this point, Pharaoh already knows who God is. Pharaoh knows that God is real deep down inside, but he's still living in rebellion, just like a lot of people today. They know God's real. They know what's coming, but they still keep their heart cold, and that's a dangerous place to be because no man can fathom the pain that is going to be felt during the tribulation in hell. Nobody wants to be here. As a matter of fact, it's going to make the Holocaust look like a walk in the park. The Bible says there has never been any time before this that's going to be this bad. What's coming? But we still harden our hearts from God. The world still hardens their heart from God. They mock God. So much filth out there. Young people, if you don't understand what they're doing to, doing to you, you got to wake up. Older people, too, they get involved in it. All the junk that they're throwing out you in the, in the music and stuff, people are like, that's my culture. That's my thing. You don't understand. The big dogs that are putting that out, they're laughing at you because they're just trying to use you like a whore. That's the truth. They're using you to go out there to buy all their products, to push all their stuff, to push their agenda so they don't have to. But it's up to us as children of God to say, no, I ain't going to do that. You are not going to use me like that. I was born to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was born to love on those that were hurting. I was born. Does it mean we're born to be perfect? No. How many people, how many people made a mistake this week? Anybody make a mistake this week? Good. Good. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And so Moses made many mistakes along the road. He made many mistakes. It even says that God got upset with him because he kept saying, God, I don't want to do it. Oh, God, I don't want to do it. God, I can't do it. And the Lord's just like, no, I'm sorry, you're going to go. And if I need to send Aaron with you, I'll do it. 
So here we are. He's went back and forth to Pharaoh nine times already to warn him. And Pharaoh's like, nope, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So chapter 11. This is after Pharaoh had told Moses, if I see your face one more time, dude, right? He said, if I see your face one more time, I'm going to kill you. He was done. He was fed up of seeing Moses. Why? He's a sore loser. God was already showing his mighty power, was already shaking Egypt, was shaking that place. Chapter 11. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague to Pharaoh in Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor, every woman from her neighbor, articles of silver and articles of gold. What God was doing right there is that he had already promised, this was fulfilling a prophecy right here. When he said, go ask your neighbors for silver and gold, he was telling them to go ask his slave masters, to go ask the Egyptian people, the people they lived by, ask them if they could have silver and gold. And the, the Egyptian people, Pharaoh had a hardened heart, but the Egyptian people, they were over everything that had just happened. The frogs, the plagues, the locusts, they were like, take anything, just get out of here, please. Right? They wanted them gone. Pharaoh, Pharaoh's the one that didn't want them. But when he told them to go, to go ask them for articles of silver and gold, that fulfills the prophecy that we just talked about a couple months ago with Abraham, where God told Abraham that his people would be persecuted and they would be under persecution for 430 years. But when they would leave, they would be blessed with silver and gold. God was showing right now that they were getting ready to get back that prophecy. They were going to be blessed. God was going to send them out blessed with, then, with more than they had and they came in. Oh, Pastor Dave, wait a minute. The prophecy said 400 years, but they were there 430 years. That's right. But you remember who they were with the first 30 years. They were with Joseph. And while they were with Joseph in Egypt, they had favor. It wasn't until Joseph left or he passed away and those rulers passed away that, that things began to change. So the 400 years is dead on, exact, and it's awesome that God remembered this promise to them. So he says, that he would get to go take, ask for articles of silver and articles of gold. Verse 3, And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man, Moses, was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. God gave Moses great, great strength. God gave Moses a great name so that people could know that he is God. Moses was his mouthpiece. Amen? Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land in Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and the firstborn of all the animals. And there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was, as was not like it before, nor shall be again. But against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move his tongue against a man or a beast, that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between Egypt and Israel. So the Lord is saying right now, this is it. I'm going to move right now. I'm going to strike down the firstborn. Now, many people that, that try to argue against the Bible, they say, well, why did God do that? Wasn't that a hateful thing? You remember later on in the Bible, what does it say? It says you reap what you sow, is it not? What, what did Pharaoh do to him? Pharaoh ordered the execution of all the babies of the Israelites, of the Hebrews. He ordered for all of their babies, all the baby boys to be murdered. All these things came against them. And then God still gave Pharaoh all these warnings, but Pharaoh didn't want to listen. So now the hand of God has to move. And it didn't just move, but it was powerfully prophetic in nature. You got to hear this because this is, this is amazing, right? Just track with me for a minute. Uh, starting off at verse 8. And all these servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out and all the people who follow you. After then, I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. He went, and gave, he went and gave this last word, and at this time, every time Moses went before Pharaoh, every time Moses spoke, he was just like, hey, I'm just doing the will of God, I'm telling you. This time, it says Moses was angry. Moses was done. It wasn't anger like the world sees. It was righteous anger. How many of you know it's okay to be angry about stuff? It's okay when there's persecution. It's okay when there's injustices. It's okay when there's stuff. It's okay when the enemy's coming against you to say, I am upset at that filthy liar. I'm upset. Moses had righteous anger. They will not let God's people go. What more is it going to take for this man to turn over the people, my Lord? Everything has happened. 
All kinds of stuff has happened, plagues and things, and still he wants to hold on. Let me remind everybody in here that can hear my voice. You're accountable for what you hear. And if God has tugged at your heart and you stay hard and you don't want to give it to God, then you might find yourself at a point that you live God no other choice than to act however he must act to get your attention. Why would God bring bad stuff about me? God is not the author of evil, but God will lift his hand off you and allow things to happen to wake you up. Why? He cares more about your salvation than your happiness here on earth. He cares more about you being with him for eternity than having everything that you want, right? We know in this world there will be what? Trials and what? And tribulations. But we know that if we walk with him, all things work for the good to them who love the Lord and be called according to his purpose. And it says, he left in great anger, verse 9, but the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you so that my words may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all the wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now remember, when it says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh already had his position. He already didn't want to listen to God, so the Lord just pretty much turned him over to his ways. He's like, I'll support you in your stance because he's, God's going to use it for the honor and glory. It wasn't that God made Pharaoh not listen. Pharaoh wasn't going to listen anyway. God knew that. God said, okay, I support, I'll support you in that position because I'm about to do something. I'm about to show the world who I am. I'm about to show these people that it doesn't matter how big their pyramids are. It doesn't matter how rich they are. It doesn't matter how big their armies are. I will bring them down to their knees at a moment so that they know that I am God, the, Ab the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? And he did not let the children of Israel go out of the land still. Chapter 12. This is the meat of today's word right here. This is the meat of today's word. So then the Lord does something. He says, now we need to prepare for what's getting ready to happen. Now we need to set the stage for this great exodus that's getting ready to happen. You need to prepare your hearts. How many of you know that before you want God to do something for you, before you move out in a big decision in your life, before you step out in doing, making a big job decision, marriage decision, uh, buying a house, before you step out in the big decisions in life, starting a ministry, right? You are to take it to God in prayer and fast and consecrate yourself before the Lord so that he can make sure that he leads us in the right way, amen? Because it's not about our will, it's about his will, right? And so chapter 12, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be, uh, shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. Don't worry, if you hear the mic going in and out, we got an amp going out over here that we have to replace soon. Verse 4, And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbors next to his house Take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Okay? The lamb has to be without. The Lord's giving very specific instructions on what they need to do before this great, great veil of death comes over Egypt and begins to strike down the enemies. The Lord's like, I'm trying to tell you how you could remain protected, my people. The lamb has to be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day on the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill at twilight, and they shall take the blood and put it on the doorpost and on the lintel. The lintel is the top of your door. It's the, giant, the lintel was a giant piece that held between the two uh, doorposts, okay? You shall put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts, okay? Doorpost and the lintel of the house where they eat. Then they shall eat the flesh that night, roasting it in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Okay? So it had to be unblemished, without defect. Right? A, a blemish is an acquired uh, defect. It is, it is a lamb that's been rescued. When he says about a blemish, it's a lamb that's been rescued from a wolf. Maybe the wolf bit it. Maybe the wolf clawed it and there's scratches everywhere or, or fell down the side of the hill and had some of the, the wool peeled off. Those were blemishes. It couldn't have a blemish. The lamb had to be perfect. 
And Peter tells us that we were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and the lamb without blemish and without spot is what was put on the cross that day. A spot. It couldn't have a spot either. That's an inherited defect. Listen to me what I'm telling you right now. This is very important. It couldn't have an acquired defect, something that just happens just from life, getting hurt, something. It couldn't have an inherited defect either. That's something that just comes in through the bloodline, that comes in like that. It could not have any inherited defect or any part of the uh, genetic structure messed up. Why? Because Jesus came without sin. He was the perfect lamb, without blemish, without defect. And he was the perfect one that would come years later to free the whole world of their sins. Not to give people what they wanted. Not to save people from going through hard times. Man, so many Christians get it twisted today. Oh, it's God's fault that I went through this. It's God's fault that I went through that. It's God's fault. No, it's not God's fault. We will have trials and tribulation in this world. I will say, men in this room, how many of you guys call yourself a man? Raise your hand if you call yourself a man. Right? Then we need to straighten out our back and read the word of God and carry it like men and walk with our head up high and do what we got to do for God. Amen? Amen? Women, how many people in there call yourself, in here call yourself a woman? You're like, I'm a woman. If you're a real woman of God, then you will be Proverbs 31. You will stand and you will say, Lord, I am willing to go out and do what you called me to do, no matter the cost. Amen? The lamb had to be without blemish, right? The lamb was going to be a true symbol. Let me, let me just share this real quick before we move on to the next one. The lamb had to be the true symbol. Types and shadows of Jesus. The, in, the, in the Old Testament, the story of Christ was all over the place. And people just didn't know that he was preparing them a thousand years later what was going to come. People are like, man, that's a long time to wait for the Messiah, right? A couple thousand years? It is, but what does the Bible say? One day is as a thousand years, right? It, it, time passes by. God's time is not our time. And so the Lord tells them, put the blood over the doorposts. Get it ready. Get the lamb that's without blemish. And what happens? We fast forward and we look at that parallel years later when Jesus had to be the perfect sacrificial lamb. Right? It was a Passover. Death was coming to the Egyptian people. Death could not be stopped. The only way it could be stopped was by them putting the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. And it had to be a perfect lamb. And, and over 2,000 years later or more, Jesus was that sacrificial lamb. And when Jesus hung on the cross, they did not break a bone on his body. Why? Because it was prophesied that it would be without blemish, without anything wrong. Jesus had no sin. He knew no sin, though he walked with us. And as they put, as his blood was shed... Over that, that gave us entrance into eternity with an almighty God, and it forgave us for our sins. And he, right, what's going on right now? The enemy is coming at us. There's demonic oppression. There's demons festering. There's witchcraft. There's stuff happening. You don't see it happening in, our, in, 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 the, in the, the kind of programming we're seeing on TV, the kind of stuff we're seeing. You guys may not see it, but there's more demon possession and stuff happening now more than I've ever seen in my life. Evil spirits just manifesting, stuff just happening. Why? Because the devil's mad because, because he knows his days are numbered. And many people in the church today say, God, I'm tired of the way the church is. I'm tired of the way everyone is, is so evil these days. And how are we going to stop this from happening? We don't have to worry about it. All we have to do is have the blood of Jesus Christ over our heart, be covered in the blood of Jesus Christ, and that shall not affect our house. Like Brother Rick said earlier, and I don't care if this sounds crazy. You guys know me. I'm not into any hyper messages or stuff like that, but I will tell you one thing. I do believe that God's economy is different. God's economy is different, and God will give his children what they need. I didn't say what they want. I said what they need. God will supply our needs. God will take care of us. Just like God differentiated the Egyptians from the Israelites so that they can know that he is God, I believe that we're coming into a season in this country where God's going to differentiate those that walk with him and those that don't. And there's going to be a lot that sit in church that aren't going to get that blessing. Why? Because they don't really walk with him. I'm talking about true repentance. I'm not talking about saying I'm sorry and doing the same thing again. I'm talking about repenting of what we do and walking away from it and saying, Lord, I need to change my ways. God, I need you to cover me in the blood. I need to anoint my house. We can't just serve God at church. We have to have the doorpost in our house covered too with what we do, what we allow in there, what we watch. Many parents say, I've lost control of my kids. I say, get control of it. Get a backbone. I got a college-age son, and I got two other high schoolers. 
And I'm not afraid to say it. If they step out of line, they'll still get it from me. Why? I'm the man of my house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, I need independence. I'm getting older. Cool. You need independence? Go out and get your own house. Pay your own electric bill. Pay your own gas bill. Pay your own food. Pay your everything. But while you're in my house, you will serve the Lord and you will adhere to my rules. And the Lord is telling us, all the believers, while you're in my house, I don't care if you're looking for a hyper message. I don't care if you want prosperity gospel. I don't know. I don't care if you want hyper prophetic or hyper. I don't care. The Lord said, while you were in my house, you were to feast on the word of God, the unadulterated word of God. And then I will manifest the Holy Spirit in you. Then I will bring to you what you need. Many people today, many churches, many movements are trying to copy other churches and the different, oh, there was a big move over here. Let's copy it. Let's do it. Oh, God moved like this in South Africa. Let's do that at our church and people will be impressed. No, that, I am so blessed for what God does everywhere else, but I want what God has for the healing place. I want what God wants to move here. I want the miracle that God has for us. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you a miracle right now. Look around you. Not a lot of people here, right? Our bills are overwhelming. We have a lot of bills. I won't even tell you what the the... the monthly is for this property but let me tell you something it doesn't matter when the seats begin to shrink we actually get more to pay the bills more stuff comes in to take care of the house my god is not chained down by this by this weak economy my god is all powerful he's all knowing if you base your if you base your relationship on god based on what's happened in your life you're going to be miserable the rest of your life there's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened to me any of you guys in here have been through some stuff, right? There's been a lot of bad stuff that's happened. I've had people in the church. I've had people in the last 18 years in this church move against me demonically, try to hurt me. I'm not lying. I've had people try to hurt me physically. I've had per people trying to plan out the demise of me and my family. We've had wicked people. We've had witches in our presence. We've had things come in, but guess what? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I am not afraid. Have we been afflicted? Yes. My body has been afflicted. Ever since I started preaching full gospel, everything, my body has been afflicted. Pains and different things happening that I can't explain, but I say, Lord, whatever it takes, God, I don't know how long I'm going to be here, but if I have to go through pain and misery without having, I don't care, God, because I'm, I'm working towards the next step. I'm working towards heaven. I'm not worried about here. I'm worried about up there. I'm not worried about a 401k because my retirement plan is out of this world. It's with Jesus. It's with everything. And I know that God will supply it. In this room right now, there are many ministers, I believe. In this room, there are many of the young people that are in here that you're going to minister someday. You may not know it right now, but you're going to minister. And it's by the blood of Jesus and the Passover lamb and praying mamas and daddies and praying grandmas and grandpas and great grandmas and great grandpas that have kept you safe. And I believe that God's going to fulfill that in your life no matter what it looks like right now. Amen? No matter what your children are going through right now, no matter what they're dealing with, no matter how rebellious... I told you guys, I don't ever put my kids on a pedestal because when I was growing up, I hated that. I hated it. Why? Let me tell you something. I was a horrible example of a teenager in the church. I took the kids from the church. Joe knows. This is my best friend growing up right here. We got into trouble together. I'm not proud of that, but he can account. We used to take the kids from church out to go get involved in a lot of stuff they shouldn't have been getting involved in. We introduced kids to a lot of stuff, and it was all cute and fun then until years later that we started watching our friends die out from addiction, from suicide, from other stuff when we had a chance to make a change early. I'm telling you, no matter what your kids are going through, no matter what's going on, keep praying. Keep pleading the blood of Jesus over them. Keep praying fervently. I believe that God will do it. The Bible says, train a child up in the ways of the Lord, and when they get older, they will not depart. I stand on that. I believe that. My children are not perfect. My children make mistakes, but doggone it, I'm not going to hold religion over their head. I'm going to hold the love of Christ and pray for them until they step out of it. Amen? And so God was leading the people. He was telling them what they had to do. Prepare this Passover lamb. It has to be without blemish, unbroken. It has to be ready. Now listen to this. Talk about prophecy. The way he just described the lamb 
for the Passover was describing Jesus Christ to a perfect. But listen to this one. In verse 9, chapter 12, verse 9, the instructions from God says, Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but instead roast it in fire. Well, Dave, what does that mean? That he just wanted to barbecue the meat and put some barbecue sauce and whatever, right? Throw some stuff. No, no. It says do not boil it in water. It says that, that to make it in fire. And what happened? Years later when it came, when John the Baptist was baptizing in the river, what did he tell them? He said, you know what? I baptize you in water, but there's one coming that will baptize you in fire, right? And that was, that was proclaimed and that was brought forth by Jesus. And when Jesus came, and the way Jesus is today, because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, when you give your life to Jesus, I'm not talking about saying a cute prayer and then going out and continuing to sin. I'm not talking about saying, God, I kind of want to be an acquaintance with you, but I want to live for Satan too. No, I'm talking about when you say, God, I need to live for you. I'm going to give everything over to you. I repent for my sins. When God baptizes you in fire, let me tell you something. It's a life-changing experience, and you have that confidence, and you know that nothing can stand against you. Because we have an almighty God. I have no confidence in myself. Dave can't do nothing. Dave's a failure. Dave will mess things up. But when I'm walking in the Lord, I know that my Lord is a steamroller. And anything the enemy throws in my way, the Lord's going to roll that over. The enemy is good at, at, at rejecting God's prayer. You see how many times God asks Pharaoh, listen to me and do what I told you. I believe God has been telling the church for years, listen to me closely. This is prophetic in nature. He has been saying for years, listen to me, church. Something is coming. You think that you're going to live in this great revival and everything's going to be honky-dory in your life. No, he's saying, listen to me. Tough times are coming upon the church. Persecution is coming upon the church. But if you are in me, I will shield you. If you are in me, I will protect you. I will give you the strength to endure it, not to get out of it, but to endure it. How many people in here, when the guns come out and they start putting a gun to your head and saying, do you serve Jesus? How many people in here are going to have the backbone to stand up and say, I serve Jesus. Go ahead, pull that trigger, bro. I know where I'm going. Right? Go ahead, pull that trigger. I love Jesus. You can do it. But like I've said before, a lot of people say they're ready to die for Jesus, but yet they can't even live for him from day to day. We want to live in sin. We want to play with the devil. We want to play with, with lust and with hatred and with bitterness. And we don't want to do what we're supposed to do. Then when bad things happen to us, don't be surprised because we are reaping what we sow. But if you want blessings in your life, in your children's life, then we need to begin to reap the word of God. Bless. We need to begin to sow the word of God. Sow the works of God and be humble and submitted. Says, Do not eat it raw, nor boiled with water, but roasted in fire. Its head and its legs and its entrails, everything together roasted. Why? The one was coming that was going to be baptized in fire, the Holy Spirit. Church, I believe it's time for the church to not be quiet anymore. I think it's time for the church to be set apart on fire for God. Devil stomping, crazy, sold out ninjas for Christ. Unashamed. If you walk out of here and you're around your friends, your family, your coworkers, and you shut your mouth because you're afraid, my friend, be very careful. The Bible says if you are embarrassed with man here on earth, he will be embarrassed of you before the Father. Unashamed. We walk unashamed, men. Men in here, death before dishonor. We walk unashamed for our Lord. We know that we're not perfect, but we know where our strength comes from. We're not fooled. Amen? Verse 10, very quickly. You shall let none of the remain until morning, and what remains until morning you shall burn with fire, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist. This is what he says right here. This is crazy. And thus you shall eat it, it says, with the belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so that you shall eat in haste. So the Lord tells them right now, as you make this feast and as you roast it and as you eat it, you need to make sure that you have your belt on, your shoes on, and your staff. Why was he saying this? Because they were going to have to move. It was time to make a move. They were going to have their, they were going to give their sacrifice to God, and then it was time to make moves. It was time to do something, right? In those days, traditionally, they wore robes that went all the way down to the ground, and they would get caught up in your feet. If you tried to run, you would trip in those days. So the Lord specifically told them, lift that up, lift that up, lift your tunic up, put a belt on, and be ready to go. Be ready to move. Have your staff in your hand. Be ready for war. Be ready for what's coming. 
Listen, right now, I am telling you that God is saying the same things. We, we may not be sacrificing any lambs or meat to God here today, but the Bible says that to praise the Lord, our prayers are as a sweet aroma unto God. And as we come to church and we give a sacrifice of praise and we are praying and we are offering ourselves up to God, God is telling us something, men. God's saying, don't come, un- don't come in here not ready for battle anymore. Don't bring your family in here not ready to do battle. Don't bring your family in here if you haven't been talking the scripture to them all week. Don't bring yourself in here if you haven't been in my word. He's saying, put that belt on. Put on the armor of God. Put on the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, right? The belt of truth, the sandals of the gospel of peace. Hold the shield of faith. Hold the sword and be ready for battle because I'll tell you something. You may not hear it right now. I know some of you do. I know some of you in here walk in the prophetic and you know what I'm talking about. But I am telling you right now, I've been hearing hearing the marching sounds. I can hear the marching. There is a massive army assembling in the heavens above getting ready for the war of all wars. And soon and very soon, that trumpet's going to blast. And I look forward to the day. Listen, the devil has mocked us long enough. The devil has murdered our family long enough. The devil has taken our young ones in suicide and overdoses and murder long enough. The devil has taken your peace in your marriage long enough. The devil has taken the peace with your children long enough. The devil has taken your health long enough. The devil has done this long enough. I believe that there's a time coming that when the trumpet hits the lips of the angel, the devil's going to be so afraid, he's going to tremble and he's going to know. And those demons will begin to scatter. Demonic entities will begin to crumble. Idols that have been raised up against God will be utterly shattered and destroyed before an almighty God. Why? Because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even those that don't want to stand with God, Satanists, atheists, whoever it is, they can stand and say, I'll never bow down before God. We'll see. Because when that blows, you will hit your knees and you will acknowledge the one true God. Everyone will. The devil knows his day is coming. The devil knows what's happening. And so Moses was preparing them for what was coming. God was speaking to him. He says, be ready to go. Verse 12. And it will pass through the land of Egypt at night, and it will strike all the firstborn of the land in Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt. This is beautiful right here. He said, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That's what's coming. The idols of Molech. You may not know what I'm talking about, but we can go to some Bible studies. The idols of Molech and sacrificing babies to the god of the, the pagan god, the Baals, demonic worship, the demonic movements that have raised themselves up. Yeah, I'm talking about the demonic movements that everyone tries to make them seem like they're okay, but they ain't really okay. They're not with God. All the movements and all the gods that have raised themselves up in our country, a time will come where God's going to utterly destroy them. I promise you that. You want to walk in power? How many of you people hear that? How many people feel that something's brewing right now in the air? Anybody in here feel something's happening? We may be back and we're, we're like, Lord, when's it going to happen, God? When is this going to, our country is under assault right now. When is something going to happen? Be patient. It's in God's time. You want, begin to pray. Begin to pray for our leaders. Begin to pray for our military. Begin to pray for our kids in the schools. Begin to pray because there's going to be a great outpouring that comes. But my brother and sister, it's going to come with a heavy, heavy battle. There's going to come a price. If other civilizations, if God's people throughout the Bible have gone through persecution, what makes us think that we're not going to have to go through it? What makes us think that we're not going to end up in full-blown warfare against the enemy? Do not be afraid of the one that can take your body, but be afraid of the one that can take your body and your soul and cast it into hell. Worship Jesus. I stand before you today in all, in all just humility to God, that we don't have to worry when you're in God. Man, I can drop dead tomorrow of some virus. Something could happen to me. Someone could come and chain me up and lock me up. A shooter could come in here right now and they could put a bullet to my head. But it doesn't matter because I am living eternally already. And in Jesus Christ, nothing will stop the move. And they can kill me, man. But they're going to make me more powerful in Jesus. It's, 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 it's on. 
It's on for Christians. The Bible says that those that are taken up to be with him, they are going to come back in the second coming of Jesus Christ, and they're going to lay waste to an enemy once and for all, and the enemy will be cast into the pit because that's where he belongs. Oh, it may look like he's winning right now. He ain't winning. It may look like he has everything under control right now. He doesn't. God's waiting for the church to wake up. God's been giving the church instructions for a long time to prepare their hearts, and the church hasn't listened. I'm here to tell you, it's time to wake up and get serious with God because there's a battle coming to your doorstep, and we must be ready. Amen? Amen. It can't be won with flesh. It can't be won with our own words. It can't be won with money and big buildings and fancy things. It'll be won by sold out believers in Jesus Christ that are filled with the unadulterated word of God and the love of Christ and ready to go out there and conquer the enemy. You want stuff to start happening? Start breaking down the strongholds in your neighborhoods. This sounds crazy, but I promise you, it's bananas. You'll get attacked, but you'll begin to see miraculous things begin to happen. Start to walk around your neighborhood. And as you're walking around your neighborhood, pray for God to break the strongholds, the wickedness, the demonic powers, the things that are going on in homes. Just begin to pray by faith and watch what God begins to do. Will you be attacked? Yes, you will. But is it worth it? Yes, it is, because God has called us to be there for everyone, for the least of these. Amen? And so he said, I am the Lord, and the blood will be a sign for you upon the houses that you are. And, and as the Spirit comes, Jesus said, it will not destroy you. It will pass over you. It will be away from you, and it will hit them. So this day will be unto you, unto me, a, for you, a memorial. And you shall keep its feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And you shall keep it as a feast, as an everlasting ordinance. Did God say that this ends at the end of the New Testament? No, he said this was an everlasting ordinance. The Passover is an everlasting ordinance to us to remember what Jesus did, not only in Egypt, but what God did on the cross that gave us the chance to be here today and say, Lord, we're part of your family, grafting us into the vine. And then he goes on with some, he goes on with some other things, and he says, he tells them, and when you're doing this, he's like, let me find no leaven in your home. No leaven. You're to eat bread. You're to eat the unleavened bread. What does that mean? Leaven in the Bible was symbolic of sin. What does it do? Sin, leaven, right? It's almost like yeast. It puffs up, right? It makes your bread, it makes your bread big. And what does the Bible say? Do not be puffed up, right? It says pride comes before the fall. As a matter of fact, it says pride is a detestable thing to God. God hates pride, right? Jesus said, have no leaven in your bread. Get rid of it. The Lord was, the Lord was saying symbolically to them, get rid of the sin. Walk away from it. Turn away from what you've done. Do you remember when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well and he went up to her and everyone was speaking against her? And can you imagine what they were saying? That woman's a prostitute, God. That woman's been with all kinds of men. She's a whore. She's this. She's that. And Jesus walked up and I believe he drew a line in the sand. Right? And he told them, ye who have no sin cast the first stone. Nobody could throw the first stone. Why? Because they all had sin in their life. But remember what Jesus turned and told her? He said, woman, where are, your, where are your captors? Where are they at? He said, now go and sin no more. Jesus is here to set us free, but he's telling us not to go back to that sin. I warn you, church, the Bible says that every time you sin, every, every time God has broken a bondage free in your life and you go back to it, it's seven times stronger, the Bible says. It has a stronghold, but I'll tell you, God is still breaking chains. God is still breaking bondage. God is still all-powerful, Right? He said, do not put the leaven in the bread. Eat the unleavened bread. Do not walk in pride. Do not walk in your sin. Consecrate yourself and prepare yourself. Let me tell you, when we come to church on Sundays, all week we should be battling with those spirits. Lord, we're going to prepare ourselves for Sunday. We're not going to eat that. We're going to say no to this. We're going to say no to that. So when we come in, the full power of the Holy Spirit will hit us. Amen? I'm telling you, you guys are all, all of you, amazing beautiful people and God loves you and it doesn't matter what you've done it doesn't matter how bad you've been it doesn't matter listen I can sit here and tell you guys story stories that would make the the church elders want to kick me out of the church right 
I can tell you stories of how I used to live and stuff that I used to be involved in, but it was never about me. The minute that I hit my knees and repented and gave it to Jesus Christ, he cast it as far as the east is from the west. Do people still throw it in my face? You bet they do, but it doesn't matter because God forgave me, and I'm walking in his glory today. I'm walking in his calling. I'm walking in what he called me to do. Young people, God's shaking at your hearts right now. Young people in here, God's shaking at your hearts. The older generation is getting older. Those grandmas and grandpas that used to preach in power, they're getting older. They're passing away. That time is coming. Who's going to stand up next? Where's the young generation that's going to stand up like lions and say, I want to lead my Christ to Jesus. I don't want to just be part of culture, but I want to be less worried about selfies and, and, and movements and fashion and being politically correct. But I, I want to push all that aside, and I want to start marching for Jesus Christ and going against the enemy at every angle. Young people, we need you. Young people, we need you. Older people, we need you to walk like God called you to do. No excuses. Older people in here, we need you to model Jesus Christ at your home more than ever, not just in the church. It's not about what you do in church. It's about what you do behind closed doors that makes you a Christian. Amen? Prepare yourself. Don't eat the leavened bread. So the Lord moved them in the whole Passover, the Passover feast, getting ready, and things begin to move. Right? And, 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 the, and they did that, and they, they sacrificed, and they, they, they put the, the, the portion over the fire, and they, and they ate, and they did what they had to do, and they made haste, and they covered the blood of the doorpost. And on that fateful night, when the spirit of death entered into Egypt, and it began to snuff out the life of the Egyptian children, the firstborn, as it went into Goshen is where the Israelites were at. They were in Goshen. They were in the area of Goshen, right next to Egypt, as that, as that heavy heavy spirit of death entered into there, it stopped at every home and it passed right over. Let me tell you something. Regardless of what's going on in our country right now, regardless of the death, the heavy spirit of suicide, of drug addiction, of lust. Have you guys noticed the perversion is worse than ever today? Perversion on all levels. Let me tell you something that you might not want to hear, and I don't care if you don't want to hear it. It's the truth. The LGBTQ movement has always been a prepping point for pedophilia. It's coming. I don't believe that. The Bible says this. I was at a church in Denver that says that it's okay. No, I'm sorry. The Bible says no. The Bible does not condone that whatsoever in any way, shape, or form. Now, are we mean to people? No. I have gay family members. I have gay friends. I show the love of Christ to them. I'm not, I'm not bashing people. I'm saying what's right before God is right before God, and we're to stand for what's right. Amen? Just like when I was stuck, when I was stuck on my bottle and living that way, I didn't like it when the sisters from the church came to me and said, Dave, you're going to burn in hell if you don't stop that. You're going to lose your family. You're going to kill yourself. I didn't like to hear it, but guess what? It's what I needed to hear, amen? I think the church needs to hear the word of God. But as, as, the, as all these demonic things are happening in our country, and people are afraid, oh my God, the virus, and oh my God, monkeypox now, and oh my God, this, and oh my God, right, this, and that, and this is coming. Yes, a lot of stuff is going to come. Oh, did you hear about the war, and the war here, and the war in Ukraine? Yes, what did the Bible say? pestilences you'll hear rumors of wars right we are in the last days if you cannot see it people God is shaking everyone all the signs are there if you're not right with God my Lord you do not know the pain and the suffering that's ahead of you you must come to God right now while you can and repent well Dave I'm a Christian I'm good I asked God into my heart several years ago I may not live for him but at least I asked him I'm sorry that's wrong if you are away from God and not living for him that, that you can't do that you can't you can't take God's grace and turn it into a filthy, dirty thing. You can't take advantage of God. I'm not telling you the story of Aladdin today. You can't just, oh, God, when I need you, but then when I don't, know, We must fully submit to God and say, Lord, we love you. Take away this stuff from us. And we must put the blood over our heart's doorpost. Again, let me make this very clear. Is anybody in here perfect? We all have stuff that we don't like, right? If, if, if spiritually, if God allowed me to go through to everybody right now, if I was able to go through right now and just begin to open up everybody's life for everyone to see all of your secret sins, what you're doing behind closed doors, the way you think, the way you talk, the way you really act, the way you really think about God, if God would allow that to happen, I guarantee you that everyone in this room is going to have stuff that's going to fall out of that closet they're going to be very embarrassed about. Let me tell you something. 
Don't wait for God to expose you because exposure is coming. I told you guys over a year ago, God put Luke 8, 17 in my heart, and he said it's going to happen in a way that we've never seen it happen before. What is, what is Luke 8, 17? That that which is in darkness will be brought to light. God is about to expose everything. So I'll tell you what, let go of it and repent right now. Don't wait till God has to expose you for it. Amen? God is good. He'll set you free. So when the spirit hit, his people were saved. Put the blood of Christ over the doorpost in your home. Put the blood of Christ over the doorpost of your heart and walk in him and know that when the death comes to this world, when the trumpet sounds, if you are in Jesus Christ, you will be saved and you will have eternal life in Jesus. And you will go up to be in heaven. Amen? If I could have the praise team begin to pray something, play something for me. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Amen? Do you guys love Jesus? Let me ask you, how much do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? You love Jesus more than the Broncos? You love Jesus more than the Avs? All right. Then on the count of three, say Jesus as loud as you can. One, two, three. Jesus. Amen. That may sound foolishness, but it's not foolish. People can scream for other stuff. Why can't we scream for Jesus? Amen. Uh, side note, I told everyone before. That when we're in church, if you want to say an amen, if you're excited, if God is just moving on you, don't worry. You're not going to disrupt anybody. This is a Holy, Holy Spirit-filled place. This isn't a mortuary, okay? Be excited about Jesus. God is good. Amen?